um, I wanted to show this to you as a illustration of the power of the uh, vector as a mathematical object. We don't do that a lot in this class because this is lower division physics. Some of you are just getting used to the idea of vectors. Uh, but let me just show it to you uh, first. Uh, um, yeah, so, so let me do that. I think I have enough time before break to do it if I you know, don't waste too much time. So this is a simulation from FAT, PHET, Colorado, DDU. It's uh, something that they call collision lab. Um, let's see. So you know, it, you can, it's a simulation for collisions. That's really what it is. Um, let's see, can I make this bigger? Uh, I don't know if I can make it bigger. Uh, never mind. So, all right. And uh, I can make this more interesting. So like this collision, like, you know, you don't have any intuition how it should go. It just goes the way it goes. And, but the way I can make this more interesting is by setting up a situation where I feel like I should have some intuition. So that would be where both balls have the same mass and one of the balls is at rest. And the other ball comes in and hits it. And now if it's a head-on collision, then I think I kind of know what's going to happen. If it's a head-on collision, then the thing that you saw with the cart will happen, except because it's two-dimensional, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, all right. So when it hits, one almost comes to rest, two moves, right? That met, uh, and speed of two seems to be similar to speed of one. Right? That matches with your intuition? Yes? OK, so um, now this is what I want to do. Let me see, can I? Um, ah, I can show paths. Let me illustrate path. And how many people here have played billiard or pool? OK, so imagine this is your cue ball. And this is one of the um, pool balls at rest. Do you have some sense of how these two balls go after collision? There might be even a rule that you might know from, like if you're trying not to scratch. Like there might even be a rule that you know. Well, let me do this collision a few times and see if you can figure out the rule. So right now I'm showing this path um, of the two balls as they collide, right? Here's one. Let me do one more. Um, I'm going to change the velocities a little bit so that, because it's two dimension, I can get these interesting pictures. Uh, as they collide, they you know, can go in different directions when they are not you know, full head-on collision. I can make this go faster too. What do you see that's uh, maybe interesting, maybe even a pattern that consistently happens? Do you see anything that you could, uh, yeah, Steven? Yeah, this seems to be always at 90 degrees, right? So, you know, that's when you should begin to wonder, is that always true? Now, if it's true, is that something that we can prove mathematically? Let me try proving that mathematically. So this proof, um, so if you are trying to do this proof by setting up equations like this, it'll, um, well, it'll turn out to be complicated. Let me show you what I mean. So let's say this is the situation that we are describing. Um, uh, collision in 2D. And let's say we are trying to describe, all right, we have two balls of the same mass. I have a ball, uh, one ball at initial speed zero. And I have another ball of the same mass that's coming in with some initial speed, and it's going to be a vector quantity. Because it's 2D, I have to worry about um, the different directions. So um, let's say something like this. And let's say you know we define our, um, let's see, do I want, uh, you know what, let, let me not make my life overly complicated. Let me do it this way. I will say this ball is coming in, and whatever velocity it's coming in with, I'm going to use that to define my x-axis. So that the incoming ball, um, all of this, you could say it's uh, my initial speed in the x direction. 
Good? All right. So they're going to collide. And after collision, something is going to happen. Um, the one ball, this ball will probably go off in this direction. Let me call that speed V2. And this ball, um, it'll probably continue moving, right? So let me say this mass will continue moving in some direction, V1. And I guess this is the statement of what I want to prove, is V1 as a vector perpendicular to V2, right? And how many equations do you think you all need to set up? So let's quickly go over some of the facts that we can use. Um, so I, I'm obviously going to use conservation laws here. Uh, which quantities do you think are conserved that we can use? So conservation of what quantities? Momentum, yeah. You have only two quantities that you know are conserved at all. So it's a question of asking yourself, is momentum conserved? Well, I'm describing this collision, so it must be conserved. And the, is energy conserved? Oh, you know what? I haven't said it yet. Um, here, actually, energy is conserved. So in this simulation, there's a parameter called elasticity. And when I change this elasticity, you will see that, um, yeah, you will see that the feature that we saw changes. So, so somehow the feature that we saw, it probably depends on this being elastic. So let me say it's not just a collision, but it's an elastic collision in 2D. So we will have conservation of momentum and energy. So how many equations do you think I need to set up? So it's easy to think too, because that's what you saw me do here, right? I set a, con a conservation of energy equation, and then I set a conservation of momentum equation. I want you to think carefully. What did we say about momentum that's uh, different from energy or kinetic energy? Like, it's a vector quantity. So the only reason I had to set up only one equation here is because I was dealing with a one-dimensional collision. Here, now it's two-dimensional, which means I have to say that, um, so this is what I need to say. I have to say conservation of energy. So when I say conservation of energy, what I end up saying is, all right, so energy is conserved. That means my kinetic energy before is equal to kinetic energy after, right? And this is, this is one equation. Um, it, you know, energy scalar, I don't have any components to worry about. But when I say conservation of momentum, that's when I have to remember that momentum is a vector quantity. It's a vector quantity, so when I write down, when I write down the conservation law, when I say momentum before as a vector is equal to momentum after as a vector. And this really, is a, it's a shorthand. It's a shorthand that says, um, it, so if you want to fully expand this out, this is what you have to say. That uh, momentum in the x component is uh, conserved. Like x component separately on its own is conserved. And its y component on its own separately is conserved. And uh, I keep forgetting this symbol. Let me just write it all. Uh, when I'm adding this up, I'm talking about the total kinetic energy, total kinetic energy, total momentum, total momentum. So when you're dealing with a collision in 2D, at a minimum, you have to set up one, two, three equations. And here's the final thing that will make this a kind of a nightmare. Um, what, what would you look for? to say that this condition here holds? Like what would you look for to say um, this, the two, two velocities, or you could say two momenta, 
um, I can at least do that much that you know, velocity and momentum are in the same direction. So what, what would I look, for, look at to say the two momenta are perpendicular? Like the y component in general, the, the looking at this final component here, the, you know, it would be nice if a y component was zero and everything was in the x component, right? Then we could say, yeah, yeah they are perpendicular. But um, the y component, uh, wait, wait, um, sorry, I got this uh, mixed up. Um, so, so, uh, so, you know, when you write it out, this is what it looks like. Um, so P1x plus P2x is equal to this, and this you are saying P1y plus P2y is equal to this, right? So I end up with two components describing momentum vector P1, and I end up with another component that's describing momentum, component, momentum vector P2. So when you are given two vectors, let's say you somehow went through all of this and found these individual components. What would you look for to say that these two vectors are perpendicular? Yeah, so this is where I want to use the vector notation to demonstrate how much it simplifies this calculation. So I, you know, we won't do this a lot. We'll just, I'll just do this once to prove this one interesting factoid about elastic collision of two masses of equal mass where one was at rest. It's a very specific situation, but it's useful to know. So, um, so let's do that. So let me write out this first equation. Um, I'll just do it in place so that, do I want to, I think, do I have a, I think I have enough space here. So let me do it here. So uh, first, I want to rewrite the conservation of kinetic equation. So all right, I want to say kinetic energy is conserved. So my initial kinetic energy was given by this speed, right? So it'll be 1 half m v naught squared. That's all of my initial kinetic energy. What expression would I use to write down my final kinetic energy? I need to use both velocities, v1 and v2. So unlike other situations we were looking at before, both of these objects are moving. They both have some kinetic energy. I can't ignore one over the other. So I just have to write it out. So kinetic energy of ball one, it will be 1 half m the speed of v1 squared, right, plus the kinetic energy of this ball, so 1 half m, speed v2 squared. Good. It squared looks a little bit scary maybe, and I will, I guess, leave it there. And this is what I'm going to do for the momentum equation. I'm going to say, where's my orange pen? Ah. Um, I'm going to say this equation here. So I was saying how uh, this vector means it actually has components. I have to worry about those components, right? So this is where I want to show you the power of the vector notation and that product. I'm just going to write this out as a vector. So this is where I do have to be careful because I am really writing down equations to n3. And when I write this vector arrow thing, that will be continual reminder to me that this is a vector equation. It really has all these components. But let's start out with that. So my initial momentum is going to be mass times that, right? So it'll be, let me write out this. So it'll be mass times the initial velocity, v naught x hat. Yeah? All right. So I say that's equal to my final velocity. Um, sorry, final momentum. So that would be this vector momentum, P1, or mass times the velocity, mv1 plus, 
this vector momentum, m times the velocity v2. And once again, I keep reminding myself that this whole thing actually stands for two equations. So actually, from looking at this, do you already know something about the y component of momentum? If I were to break this out in the format like this, what can you say about the y component of momentum? Zero, right? Left-hand side has only x component. So right-hand side must have zero y component also. So that's good to note. Uh, I'm not actually going to use it. So this is what I'm going to from here on. Um, let me do this. So let me first cancel out all the things that cancel out so I don't have to you know, keep looking at it and make expression complicated. All these one-offs cancel, right? Yep, so it's all canceled out. And um, there's a reason these masses are the same. It's so that I can do this. I can cancel out all the masses also. So in fact, I can do the same thing here. I can cancel out all the masses also. Yep. So uh, let me write out the simplified version of, actually, is everyone OK if I just simplify this in place? I'm going to erase the quantities that I canceled out. So all this is gone. All this is gone. All this is gone. Let me ask you a question. How many unknowns do I have in this set of equations? I, OK, you are counting two. I count to at least two. So you might be looking at v1 and v2. I count to more. Because you are telling me that you don't know the speed of v1, and you don't know the speed of v2, velocity 2. There is actually more I don't know. It is a unit vector. Anybody here count four unknowns total? Asia, what are the four unknowns? Uh, the yeah. Each of these stand for having v1 in the x direction and the y direction, and v1 in the x direction and oh, sorry, v2 in the x direction and v2 in the y direction. Each of the vector quantities stand for two unknowns. Now, fortunately, this is not an additional unknown, because v1 would be square root of v1x squared plus v1y squared. So there's a, there are six unknowns. There are only four unknowns. But that's something you have to remember about vectors, that whenever you have a vector quantity, that what looks like a single symbol for an unknown actually stands for two distinct numbers that you don't know. So that's what you have. Uh, how many equations do you have? Not two. Three. It's a vector. So you have to count all that. And if it was three-dimensional, it would be even more like that. You know, Each of these would be three unknowns each. And this would be three equations, so you would have you know, six unknowns and four equations. But it comes down to this. In this two-dimensional picture, you have four unknowns and only three equations, meaning this is not a completely specified problem. Does that actually make sense, that this problem is not completely specified? Watch this. Let me have this go at, you know, exactly as I described v1 uh, initial velocity in the x direction. There are different ways they can collide. They can collide this way. They can collide this way. And there's no parameter specified in this problem to, which of, to say which of ways those will be. So, um, so what we get here is correct, that we have uh, four equations, I mean, sorry, three equations and four unknowns. So that's another reason why if you are going this approach, you would run into a problem trying to prove this. Because it turns out you don't have enough information to figure out all the components. This is where I want to show you the magic of that product. Let me um, go through these mathematical steps that I'm going to go through slowly. 
and make sure that I can justify each one of those steps to the skeptics. All right, so these are my equations, right? Good. And what I want to do is I want to multiply this equation um, by, uh, on both sides by the same quantity. Am I allowed to do that? Yeah, I can take an equation, do the same operation to both of them, and equality will be preserved. All right, so on the left-hand side, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a dot product. I'm going to take this and take the dot product with v naught x hat. That means on the right-hand side, I also have to take the dot product with the same thing. But instead of taking dot product with this, I'm going to say, oh, wait, I, want, I changed my mind. I want to take a dot product with a this vector. Am I allowed to do that? Ratana, can you explain why I'm allowed to suddenly switch my vector here? Yeah, this is the same vector as this, right? So, so I'm still multiplying by the same vector. I'm just expressing it in two different ways. Let me go through the algebra and see what happens. What does the left-hand side look like? Left hand side, what does it look like? Yeah, V naught squared and X dot X is just one, right? That's the unit vector. So V naught squared is equal to, ooh, this looks like that. That's beginning to look promising. Right hand side, all right, I have to expand this out. So let me um, do it in two steps. Um, so V1 dot, actually I can do it in one step. V1 dot product with V1, what do I get? V1 squared, that product of the vector with itself. All right, and let me do, so let me, that's one. Uh, let me do V2, that product with V2. What do you get? Yeah, it's the same thing as before. So V2 squared. I have two more products that I have to do as I distribute. There's a V1, that V2. Let me just write that one out. V1, that product with V2. And there's one more, uh, V2 dot product with the V1. So plus V2 dot product with the V1. Are these two the same thing? OK, then I can write it down this way. V1 squared plus V2 squared plus 2 V1 dot V2. Yep. And here's something that looks really encouraging. I have this equation here from conservation of energy before, right? I compare this to this. And I see a lot of same terms. V0 squared here, V1 squared here, V2 squared here. Which means I can do this. Let me call this equation 2, call this equation 1. I can take equation 1 and subtract equation 2. When I do that, what do I get on the left hand side? Zero, yeah. That gives me. What do I get on the right hand side? Yeah, two v one dot product with v two. Hmm. This is a single equation involving that product. Uh, let me write out the dot product. So that product is equal to two the magnitude of the vectors v one v two times cosine theta, where the theta is angle between them. This must be equal to zero. I know V1 and V2 are probably not zero. So that leaves cosine of theta as being equal to zero. What does that tell you about theta? 90 degrees. 90 degrees, which is what we want you to prove. So yeah, we can prove this. Um, <laughs> and um, so you know, if you do higher level engineering and math and physics classes, you are going to see this dot product more often. But this is uh, what I want it to be your first demonstration of the magical power of that product to simplify a really complicated problem. So, so yeah, sorry this went a lot longer than I was intending. Uh, let's take our break now.